Uh, there's something about him too, you know, it seems like everybody knows him. You know, you can do the modern worship courses and everybody just kind of tries to fake it. <laughs> you kick into amazing grace and the whole place just lights up. Amen. I was just wondering, how many of you men bought an Easter outfit for this Sunday? <clears throat> Amen. Uh, I don't remember doing that. Uh, but uh, I think today we're going to have a great, great time uh, not only celebrating the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ, but I want to preach today on, I think, the single greatest event that happened out of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we, we just don't hear it preached about. But you and I would not be here today if it was not for what Jesus did after resurrection. And so I want to, uh, we're going to read some different portions of Scripture because I feel like we need to be biblically sound on what I'm going to preach to you. And uh, I want to start off in Hebrews, um, the eighth chapter, and then we're going to go back over to Exodus because I'm going to have to lay a foundation here for where we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go um, Hebrews chapter 8. And then we're going to go to Exodus chapter 25. We'll start with uh, Hebrews 8 and 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum or this is the conclusion. So you really need to go back and you need to read Hebrews chapter 7 because you remember that uh, in the original there were no chapters. It was just a continuation. So he is now summing up the argument that he has been making in the previous chapters. So this is the sum or the summation. We have such a high priest who has set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So now we get to go back to Exodus chapter 25 because a lot of times when we read about the tabernacle in the wilderness, um, we don't realize that it was not something that Moses designed. It was given to him by God. And in Exodus chapter 25, um, starting with verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And the next several verses tell us what they brought. And then in verse 8, it's why God asked for this. He said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And so... When God begins to describe to Moses the pattern of the tabernacle that he wants Moses to build, God is looking at the tabernacle that is in heaven, and he is describing it to Moses. And he is telling Moses, you're going to build a replica among Israel like there is in heaven because I want to dwell among men. A little farther on in this, in this chapter, um, the Lord makes this statement. In fact, in, in uh, verse 10, he says, and they shall make an art of shittim wood, 
Two cubics and a half shall be the length thereof, a cubic and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubic and a half the height thereof. He is describing the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, you shall overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about it. In verse 16, and thou shalt put into the ark of the test into the ark the testimony or the Ten Commandments, which I shall give thee. And so God is, He has Moses make this tabernacle. We know there's an outer court, an inner court, a holiest of holies. And then he has him make the Ark of the Covenant. And he gives him the exact description of it because God is looking in heaven at what he is telling Moses to build in the earth. Amen. And he tells Moses, he says, this ark represents my presence. And he said, put on both ends of it cherubims. I can't imagine what this must have looked like. And I can promise you it was absolutely God's will that the Ark of the Covenant has never been discovered because it would have become the biggest idol in the earth. Because ultimately, Jesus became the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, if you go, I'm going to get ahead of myself here, but the Bible says that when Mary looked in the tomb, there was an angel on both ends and Jesus is laying, he, he laid in the middle. It's a, a perfect type and shadow of the Ark of the Covenant. And so the Lord told him, he said, and in this Ark, you put the commandments or you put the law inside of this. And so now Israel has this replica. I don't know if they truly understand it, but they have a replica of what is sitting in heaven that God is looking at. Now God sets up this ordinance because this is all about one reason. God says, I want to dwell among my people. We don't understand how much God wants to hang out with us. I think that Sundays are probably one of the greatest celebrations in heaven because it's a day that people set aside to minister unto the Lord, and I think it moves the heart of God. And so the Lord sets up this ordinance, and he says, now, he says, I want you to take a, a man. And in this instance, it's Moses' brother. His name is Aaron. And he said, I'm designing a certain style of clothing that he is going to wear when he comes and ministers before me. And he says, he's going to come in once a year, and the only time of the year that he's going to come in on is Yom Kippur or Day of Atonement. Think about this. Only one time a year could a man come into the presence of God. And that was on the Day of Atonement. What this accomplished was all of the sins that Israel had committed for that calendar year. Aaron would take the blood of bulls and goats and slayed them or the lamb, he would come into the holiest of holies and he would take the blood of those animals and he would put it on the mercy seat. And when he would put it on the mercy seat, it would not wash away their sins, but it would push them ahead. The blood of bulls and goats, in fact, Hebrews 10.4 says this, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should ever take away sins. So in this particular setting, the blood of bulls and goats did not give Israel fellowship with God. It just kept them from death. So if you really think about this, God is dwelling on earth amongst men, but he's in a prison. He can't come out. 
because God is divine. And his nature is holiness and righteousness and life. So he cannot come out of the holiest of holies because the people that he would fellowship with are not like him. They are stained with sin. So once a year, with, because if you go back to the beginning, God always wanted to be with men. We know this in the Garden of Eden. And then he begins to implement different ways to try to help men, whether it's conscious, the conscience of man, or whether it's judges or different things. And finally, he says, I'm just going to take a nation. And that's when he sets up the sacrificial system. And that's when the animals begin to be slain for the blood of Israel. But it couldn't take away their blood or their sins. So the Lord begins to implement a process in all of this, there is no fellowship between God and men. They vicariously have to fellowship with God through the entrance of one man who would come into the holiest of holies once a year, and that's all God had, and that's all Israel had. So now we're going to skip to the New Testament. The Bible says, and it teaches this, and you're going to have to hang in here. You're going to like this message, I promise. God realizes that human beings will never be able to live above sin with the law. The law is a schoolmaster, but it doesn't change their nature. So the only way that God the Father will ever be able to have communion with men, because God ain't going to change his nature, then he has to change the nature of men. And the only way he can change the nature of a man is to cleanse him permanently from his sins. But the demand of the law is this. The blood of bulls and goats will never suffice the demand of the law that says that man is no longer guilty of sin. So the Godhead in heaven, the Bible says this, there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of division. Some people believe in what we call oneness. Some people believe in Trinity. I, I don't care what you call it. All I know is this. There is Jesus, there is the Holy Ghost, and there is the Father. And these three comprise God. You cannot say they're the same thing because they're not. They are different, distinct, but the three of them comprise God. And if you could walk into heaven right now, you would see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So they say, what do we do? And the Word said, I will become a man. Maybe the conversation was, but a man has sin. He said, well, I will lay down my, de uh, my deity. I will lay down my glory that I have with the Father. I will robe myself in flesh, and I will live among men to show them that a man can live above sin. Jesus did not come to the earth primarily to heal lepers, to steal the storm, or to raise the dead, or even to preach the gospel. He came for one purpose, that his blood would be shed once and for all. And when that blood was shed, you and I would be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That we could sit in the year 2022 and say, I used to be bound. I used to be addicted. I used to be messed up. But because of Jesus, hallelujah, he has changed my nature. And God is not like me, but I am like God. Say, that's not right. The Bible says this, as he is in, the, in where he is, so are we in this present world. 
And it's not blasphemous to say we are like Jesus. He is our elder brother, and we have his name, we have his blood, and we have his nature. The only difference is we dwell in a temporal body, and Jesus is eternal. So Jesus comes to the earth, becomes a man. So now after, because no man has fellowship with the, and I find this interesting because men cannot fellowship with the Father or with the Holy Ghost. When you study this before Jesus is resurrected, the Bible says the Holy Ghost was not yet given because it would not come upon men who were bound by sin. No man had fellowship with the Father because of sin. So Jesus becomes a man, walks to the, comes to the earth through the womb of Mary, and begins to fellowship with men, but not in a heavenly realm, in a natural realm. This is why the disciples had such a hard time understanding Jesus' conversations. Because he was speaking out of a heavenly dimension, and they were hearing with natural ears. And they would look at each other and go, do you know what he's saying? Finally, he would say, are you wondering what I'm trying to say? And then he would explain it to them. So now we get to Jesus is at the end of his ministry. And we're going to pick up in John, the 14th chapter. And I want to spend the rest of our time here today on what happens in the next few moments in Jesus' life. John, the 14th chapter. And starting with verse 1, Jesus is with his disciples and he's talking to them. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I think it's only the King James and the New King James that use the word mansions. It, it, that's bad translation. It literally means dwelling place. So he says, in my Father's house, or where he lives, are multiple dwelling places. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, so I'm going to prepare a place for you. So if we begin to read into this, Jesus is saying, in fact, let me read the rest of this verse because then we'll pick up on this. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So, Jesus basically saying to me, he said, look, he said, there's an issue between you and the Father. And he said, where I'm going, you can't go. He said, but I'm going to go ahead of you, and I'm going to resolve this issue. He said, I'm going to go prepare a place that you can dwell with the Father, because right now something's wrong. What was it? They had an old nature. So the Lord begins to tell them, he said, I'm going away. And he said, but I will come again. And he said, there ye may be also. Now, let's flip over a couple chapters to John 16. In the 16th chapter, in verse 16... Jesus says this to him. He's still having this conversation. He says, a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. And he says, basically, he says, the reason that you're not going to see me for a little while, he says, because I'm going to my Father. Then his disciples said amongst themselves, what is this that he's saying to us? A little while, and you're going to see me, and a little while, you're not going to see me. And they're just, I'm confused, they said. And Jesus said this, he said unto them, a little while, we cannot tell what he saith. And so, Jesus 
he's trying to explain to them what's going to happen. In fact, he said this. He said, you're going to have a season where you're going to weep, but the world's going to rejoice. Most of the time when we read this, we're thinking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This has nothing to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because we won't weep at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The world's going to moan, but we're going to shout. So he's not referring to the rapture. He's referring to something that's getting ready to happen. And he said, you're going to weep for a little while because it looks like it's going to be over and I'm going to be gone. But he said, while I'm gone, you don't realize it, but I'm going to be in the Father's house and I'm going to fix the problem that keeps God from coming to fellowship with you and keeps you from fellowshipping with the Father. And so we know that Jesus is crucified, and they do weep. In fact, they give up hope. They think it's over. And uh, we're going to pick up now in John chapter 20. Verse 1, the first day of the week. Now, this is, see, we, we stop right here and we celebrate. We're so excited that Jesus has resurrected. We sing, he's alive, and he's come out of the grave, and he, he's went back to the Father, and we're going to go home one day to be with him. But if Jesus would have went back to the Father immediately after resurrection, you and I would still be messed up. So in chapter 20, it says... First day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early while it's yet dark unto the sepulcher, and she sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Verse 2, she runs and she tells Simon Peter all about it. And then verse 3, Peter goes with John, and they run and see it. And um, verse 7, it says, And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Jewish culture had this particular thing in it. When a guest came to eat, if they really enjoyed the meal, they would take the napkin, fold it by itself, and it declared that I want to come back. The reason Jesus folded the napkin was because he was declaring to them, you think I'm gone, but I'm coming back. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so she, she comes in there, and she's coming to anoint the, the body. She's coming to commemorate his death. And um, verse 11, she stands outside the sepulcher weeping, and she wept. She looked down, looked into the sepulcher. She sees two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. Verse 14, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back. She saw Jesus standing, and she knew not that it was Jesus. Now, this is very interesting because Jesus no longer has a fleshly body. Mary knows what Jesus looks like because she was at the grave. She's hung out with him for the last two years. All the disciples know what he looks like. But in two instances, after resurrection... The Bible said Jesus would appear to them, and they did not know it was him. Why? Because resurrection changes Jesus from a man back to God. 
And now for the first time, they're seeing Jesus in his glory, and he is so magnificent, they cannot comprehend who this is. If you don't believe me, go back and read about the road to Emmaus. Two men who know who Jesus is, who a prophet is, they walk with him for several miles and have no clue who it is. All of a sudden, he breaks the bread, opens their eyes, they said, my God, did not our heart burn within us and ran eight miles back in the same evening because of a divine encounter with a deified Jesus Christ in a glorified body. And so, verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou whom thou seekest? And she thinks he's the gardener. Verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turns herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Now, this is very interesting. Jesus, in verse 17, he says, don't touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended to my father, your father, to my God, and your God. Mary's so excited about Jesus being alive that she wants to hug him. And he said, hold on. He said, you can't touch me. And there's been a lot of questions about why did he say that. He is adhering to Old Testament law. When the high priest was getting ready to come into the holiest of holies and offer the blood on the mercy seat, he had to sequester himself, and he could not be defiled by anybody touching him. Jesus now has died. His blood has been shed at Calvary, and he has rose again, and you would think it's it. And here she goes to hug him. He said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. So this is what I want to show you what happened on the day that we celebrate. Because verse 19 says this, Then the same day at evening, talking about the same day that Mary came in the morning, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus comes back, stands in the midst of them, and says, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. In Luke it says, not only did he show them his hands and his sides, he said, touch me. That morning he said, don't touch me. Because I've not yet ascended to my father, but now in evening time he's in a room with all of them. He says, handle me, touch me. Look at my hands. Look at my side. So what happened between the morning that Mary saw him and that night that he showed up in that room with disciples and said, touch me? The greatest single event that would ever take place occurred on that day. And nobody really understood what was going on. Now, I want to go over to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 because these writers all got a revelation of what was happening and they begin, they would give us little bits and pieces. Ephesians 4 verse 8, wherefore he saith when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, but what is it that he first also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. When Jesus came out of the grave, he did not come out as a man robed in flesh. He came out as he was before he ever came into the womb of Mary. He was God 100%. 
There was no flesh part of him. He was absolutely restored back to the glory that he had with his father before he ever came to the earth and robed himself in flesh. This is why they couldn't hardly recognize him because no man had ever seen God till they saw Jesus after resurrection. Now Jesus is going to restore and fix everything that the devil has done on the earth. Ephesians says the very first thing that Jesus did after he was resurrected on that day, from the time that he told Mary, don't touch me, to the time that he told his disciples, touch me. The Bible said that Jesus by himself descended into hell. And he looked at Old Testament saints. There's Abraham and Daniel and Ezekiel and Moses and Jeremiah and David in Sheol. And they can't go anywhere because they still are stained with the blood of sin. Jesus walks in. Hallelujah. And his blood, oh, has already changed saints. And the Bible said he took captivity captive. He walked into hell. He looked at him. He said, you're coming out with me. Up until this point, nobody has ever went into hell and walked back out. No man has ever went into hell and walked back out. Jesus walks into hell, looks at the devil and his angels and said, go ahead, give it your best shot. They said, we don't know what to do because we've never seen anybody like you. We don't have any authority over you. Jesus said, come on, Moses. Come on, Daniel. Come on, Ezekiel. And the Bible said he led them out. He loosed them. Came up into Jerusalem. And he looked at them and he said, guys, he said, I got something I need to do. So he said, y'all just hanging out in Jerusalem for a few hours because I'm going to finish taking you on home but I haven't yet finished preparing a place for you that you can dwell with the Father. So the scripture says that after resurrection, Old Testament saints walk the streets of Jerusalem. Can you imagine the conversations that are going on? Isaiah said, you know, I've been prophesying about him David said, I saw him, hallelujah, that his soul would not suffer corruption, but I don't have any idea what he's up to right now. And they're walking around, and Moses said, what do you think he's doing? Nobody can find him. The Bible says that Jesus began to ascend up into heaven. What was he doing? He was headed for the mercy seat. In Hebrews chapter 9, I mean, I'd like to read the whole chapter, about three, three chapters, but we don't have time. But it says... Um, Verse 7 of chapter 9, we're going to kind of skip around here, but it says, But into the second, talking about the holiest of holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest of alls was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now, verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, 
Doing what? Having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, you've got to think about this. For thousands of years, for 4,000 years, or actually a little less than that, from the time that Moses constructed the tabernacle, it was a shadow of another tabernacle that we don't know how long existed in heaven. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. So the tabernacle in heaven existed before the world ever came into being. The Father would look at the ark that had a mercy seat, but inside of it, there was a law that demanded blood. It is sterile. It is clean. Nothing has ever been put on it. And the father longs to have companionship. He makes man. Man falls into sin. And even though the blood is shed in the earth of blood of bulls and goats, heaven is empty. Old Testament saints aren't there. The only thing that is in heaven is the angels and the Father and the Holy Spirit. But one day, the Bible says that we have a high priest. Jesus was the high priest. But this time, he's not bringing the blood of bulls and goats. But in between the morning and the evening, in walks Jesus. Walks into the holiest of holies. While the Father is watching walks over to the Ark of the Covenant that inside law demands justice. And no man has ever been able to meet the requirements of the law that would have allowed men to come into the holiest of holies. But that day, after resurrection, Jesus took his own blood with him, ascended up into glory, walks into heaven, walks over to the mercy seat that is covering the law. And that day, Jesus takes his bone blood, begins to drop it on the mercy seat. And as he begins to drop it on the mercy seat, law says, it is enough hallelujah and that day Jesus oh opened up a new and better way and the father looked at the son and said tell them they can come home now and Old Testament saints that were walking the streets of Jerusalem Jesus came back and the Bible says here they went and for the first time on Easter in walked Abraham in walked Isaac in walked Jacob uh, and the father looked at them uh, and said welcome home forever things have been changed the father says it's satisfied Jesus turns Walks out of heaven, comes back down to the earth, walks into a room of discouraged, confused men, said, hey guys, got anything to eat? (laughs) They gave him a piece of broiled fish. The Bible says they watched him eat it. And they can't hardly wrap their minds around. He said, it's me. Look, touch me, handle me. Why? Because he has finished the job, the purpose of the high priest, and no longer can he be defiled. 
Now, all of a sudden, everything changes in heaven because the law no longer screams for blood because the Bible says once and for all, he offered his blood and it was forever satisfying to the Father. From that moment on, Jesus, hallelujah, has opened up a new and better way. That's why he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. How did he do it? He went into the holiest of holies, uh, put blood on the mercy seat. Uh, and today, you and I are free with all of our problems, uh, with all of our failures, uh, with all the times that we mess up. Uh, we holler blood, uh, blood, blood, uh, and the blood of Jesus. Jesus uh, gets upon us uh, and uh, washes our sins away. Now, no wonder the Bible says, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things pass away and all things become new. The moment that the blood of Jesus was shed, our sins were forever wiped away. The Father looked at the Holy Ghost and said, go ahead. And on the day of Pentecost, the second person in the Godhead came out of glory, jumped on you and me, filled us with his power and set us free in the anointing of the Lord. So we do not just celebrate the fact that he walked out of the tomb. We celebrate the fact that he was our high priest and walked into heaven into the true tabernacle which man had not pitched. And after thousands of years, I don't know what he had that blood in, but he dropped it on the mercy seat. I don't know what it sounded like. I don't know what it looked like. But the moment that the lamb slain from the foundation of the world put sinless blood on the holiest of holies mercy seat God said not guilty so when the accuser of the brethren comes to you and says remember what you did a year ago or five years ago or last week you're not worthy. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You, you, you only have the right to pray. Why are you reading the Bible? You just say, the blood. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, the blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary. Oh, the blood that gives me things from day to day, it will never lose its power. Oh, it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. We're here today because of what Jesus did in a 12-hour period. My God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you mess up next week, or I mess up, we don't have to take a knife shed some blood, yeah. kill our dog, yeah. 
I ain't doing that. <laughs> At least one of them. <laughs> but all that's required from me and you, say, Father, yes. I repent. Yes. And the Father says, it's under the blood. Yes. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah, hallelujah. Before we give a general altar call, I want my wife to come because I, I want us to make an appeal for souls. Some of you, this might be the only time you come to church. But today, hallelujah, there is access in this room to Jesus. Hallelujah. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Can we stand together, church, as a family? I believe there are some here under the sound of my voice that have never given your heart to the Lord. You're not very sure where you stand with Christ, but today, today you can be a new creation in Christ Jesus. What you did yesterday can be gone. What you did last week, what you did a month ago, what you did this morning can be washed away under the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood still flows today in this room. If you're not sure of where you stand with Christ today, every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around just for a moment, would you slip up your hand and say, Pastor Candy, that's me. Would you pray for me? I'm not going to call you down front. I just want to pray for you right where you are. Slip your hand up and slip it back down and say, yes, that's me. Yes, I see. Anyone else? Anyone else? Jesus loves you. This is the best day. To receive Jesus Christ right now. Today is the day of salvation. Is there anyone else? Just slip up your hand and slip it back down. If you need Jesus in your heart, you say, I know I haven't lived the life that I, I needed to live, but today I'm ready to make a change. Just slip your hand up. Let me pray for you right where you are. Anyone else? Anyone else? Why don't we pray together as a family? If you're comfortable taking the hand of someone next to you. Let's, let's pray as a family. Can we pray everybody, front to back and side to side, repeat this prayer after me, everyone. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. I've transgressed against the laws of God. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross. He rose again that I could have eternal life. So Lord, would you wash me in the precious blood of Jesus? Will you make me a new creation in Christ? I surrender my life to you in Jesus name. Come on church, give Jesus Christ a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah! Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians in, ends with this subject. He said, Christ has been made to sit on the right hand of the Father. But it also says this, now he hath made us to sit with Christ in heavenly places. So today, we're here in the earth, in this physical body, but our inner man is sitting in heaven right now, next to the Father in Jesus. And the Bible said that Jesus is ever making intercession for us. I don't think that means that Jesus is verbally all the time saying, Father, help him, help him, help him. I think what that means is that his blood is still on the mercy seat and it ever makes intercession for you and me. So yes, we're human and yes, we mess up. 
But greater than that is we have an advocate with the Father now, Jesus, and his blood. I'm sure the Old Testament saints never really understood what happened that day till he said, let's go home. And they walked into heaven and there was the Holy Spirit and there was the Father and there's no veil. Hallelujah. So today, I want us as a church, I know we have a large crowd, but as much as we can fill the altars, I want you to take advantage in your life of the fact that Jesus has paid for your past sins, your present sins. Come on while I'm talking. And your sins that you're going to mess up in the future. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the blood answers the accusation of the law. Hallelujah. And this is why Jesus said, I have fulfilled the law. Get in as close as you can. That day, Jesus said, <clears throat> I have answered the demands of the law. No wonder we can sing power in the blood. Hallelujah. Because you hang out with the Father now. Oh, he wraps his arms around you in this altar today. Not just Jesus, but the Father and the Holy Ghost is inside of you. So right now, you and I have the fullness of the Godhead in us completely. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. My God, we are dangerous in the earth because in us dwells the fullness of God. Hallelujah. By the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that God's putting some authority in this building. Listen, you got to quit thinking of yourselves as I'm just happy to be saved. The blood made you a warrior. <clears throat> if Jesus can descend into hell and loose Old Testament saints, you and I can just ascend into the heavenlies and bind principalities and powers by the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why we sing that song. I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. Why? Because there is power. There is nothing that the devil hates more than the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood will empty out hell. The blood will save your children. The blood will change our nation. The blood will give us the nations as our inheritance by the Spirit of the Lord. All right, fire us up.
tưởng hay băng cơn tưởng chừng như cô đơn nên khi chiều xuống thấy vẫn vương trong tâm em có biết không hề về phương hồng đẹp lắm tình mình càng nồng thắm chưa bao ước vọng trong sáng giờ trong tim Oh uh-huh.
What?